It's now my opportunity to introduce Doug Johnson. I worked for Doug at the Center for Strategic and International Studies at the end of the 1980s in Washington. I, um, he's an extraordinary man, a gentleman, a scholar, and somebody who believes in being engaged in the world in a profound way. There is an excellent biography of him in your programs, and I'll leave the formality of, of the introduction for you to read there. He's an honors graduate of the US Naval Academy. He was commissioned and authorized as the youngest um, captain of a nuclear submarine at age 27 at that point in the service. Is that correct, roughly? <laughs> I'm close. The youngest officer in the US Navy to qualify command of a nuclear submarine. He went on to get a PhD in government political science at Harvard. And um, when he came to CSIS, he was the chief operating officer, but also very involved in the programs. Over the course of his years, his first years, I guess the first half decade, is that right, Doug, at CSIS, he convened a working group that involved members of Capitol Hill, people from Capitol Hill, as well as the policy community and academia. And the subject was the role of religion in world affairs. And out of that work came a book in 1994 published by Oxford University Press called Religion, The Missing Element in Statecraft. Last year, or two years ago, I guess now, uh, in commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the publication of that book, uh, Georgetown University recognized Doug for his contribution. You may ask, again, some of us here, I think, uh, I'd ask religion and world affairs. Well, this, this may sound like, at best, a marginal focus for an academic audience or an academic to topic. It isn't any longer. A lot of that is due to, to Doug Johnson and his work. I have in hand a book entitled Religion and World Affairs. It's about 700 pages long. Um, and I'll just briefly glance at the table of contents with you. Section one, secularization, desecularization, and disciplines in international affairs. Ethics of force, religion and conflict, religion and peacemaking, religion, globalization, and transnationalism, religion and economic development, religion, democracy, and the state, religious freedom and human rights, religion and the future of US foreign policy. The role of religion in the public sphere is something that is obvious to everyone in the world except Europe and the United States. Secularism plays so far the dominant role here in these two cultures, but the, to the rest of the world, religion is alive, well, and operating in domestic and international affairs. Over the course of time, and we now have an office in the Department of State that deals with engaging religious leaders around the world. Again, owing to Doug's persistent and eloquent and courageous effort. I'll close with just one thought. There is, I hope, in that biography there in the program, reference to some of the things his center has done. But if you can imagine sending people into the extremist madrasas in Pakistan and holding up a mirror to those people and helping them realize and some of those madrasas have been around hundreds of years longer than Oxford and Cambridge, with all due respect to the Rhodes Scholars in the room. But they have lost their bearing and no longer teach the wide society-enhancing and mind-expanding curriculum that they once did. This is what Doug Johnson's group has done. And over 2,000 of these madrasas, is that right, Doug, to date? Am I close? Um, it's courageous work. It's real work. It hasn't changed the world overnight, but that's one other aspect of the religion and world affairs aspect that is precious to us, and that's faith. And that's what you have, and we salute you for it. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Doug Johnson. Good evening, and uh, thank you, Fred, for that overly kind introduction. Uh, to respond in kind, uh, Fred and I share uh, past uh, involvement as water polo players, and the only difference is Fred was all American, and uh, I was not. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you this evening, particularly to uh, address so many uh, college students. Uh, you are the future, 
and uh, our hopes are dependent on you. So we really hope that you uh, can take what you hear and learn and perhaps run with it, as we have not been able to do as well as we should. I also want to uh, acknowledge the esteemed colleagues uh, who were all introduced as working group chairs. Uh, it's a real privilege to, to be here with all of you. So <clears throat> just to sort of hone your perspective a little bit, uh, some months ago I was addressing a, a, a church in Alexandria, Virginia, and I began by saying, um, you know, all of you here are Christians. And I said, and if you believe half of what you see or read in the media, you would conclude that Islam was your enemy. I said, well, what are we as Christians enjoined to do about our enemies, and what might that look like? And then I segued into uh, describing some of our center's work. Uh, but back to the topic at hand, religious extremism. First, a couple of definitions for you. I think that many of you have probably heard or seen the term Salafism. And what Salafism, for those of you who haven't, it, it means the earliest, most puritanical form of Islam. And in its purest sense, it was apolitical. That is to say, it had no uh, desire to be involved in politics. But over time, a segment of that community uh, did start to care about political ends. And they didn't care whether or not they used violence to uh, achieve them. So this group, this segment, became known as jihadi Salafism. And it's, much, it's very much like the Wahhabism that you see currently practiced in, uh, in Saudi Arabia today. Another term which uh, is widely banded about in Washington, but I suspect that few of you have actually heard about it, but it's called CVE, which is a term for countering violent extremism. And in many respects, it's sort of a uh, political correct way of saying religious extremism. Now, when we as a country have been confronted with religious extremism, our reaction has typically been military in nature. And while bombs and bullets have their place, uh, we think that what's, what's needed is a much more far-sighted response than one that gets at the ideas behind the guns. And we have found that one of the great, most effective ways of getting at those ideas behind the guns is, to, uh, is through a new form of engagement called uh, faith-based diplomacy. Now, what that is at the macro level, it just simply means incorporating religious considerations into the practice of international politics. At the micro level, it means actually making religion part of the solution in some of these intractable, identity-based con conflicts like ethnic disputes, tribal warfare, and the like that typically exceed the grasp of traditional diplomacy. Now, what does it take to practice this faith-based diplomacy? Well, I could list any number of things for you, but there's two that kind of stand out, I think. One is to have a visceral understanding of how faith drives action. And oftentimes that means for you to really have that kind of an understanding, you need to have a pretty strong faith yourself. It doesn't particularly matter which religion, but to have that faith is helpful because it, it uh, gives you credibility in a, in a sense, but it also gives you a deeper understanding. And the other thing I think that's so important is there's a need to empathize. Uh, now, empathy in its most basic form means identifying with the other person. Not only understanding their point of view, but understanding where they're coming from. What are the things that weigh in their calculus as they make decisions? And this may go back to uh, unaddressed wounds of history, for example. Uh, that still prevail. So you need to, you really need to try to get inside their skin. Now, a great military strategist that almost all of you have heard of, Sun Tzu, once said that uh, you, one needs to know thine enemy. Well, uh, you can't do that unless you have empathy for that person. 
And this sort of runs up against the fact that, you know, most adversaries disregard empathy. And they sort of automatically evolve into what we might call dehumanization. You know, the, the more you can dehumanize the other side, the easier it is to kill them, uh, for sure. So th these, you know, they run across purposes, but as Sun Tzu was suggesting, is to, if you want to fight a foe more effectively, then you need empathy. Or if you want to prevent conflict in the first place, you need empathy. So I want to read you here. So I guess, I guess I would say that if you want to resolve a conflict with minimal loss, you will engage in empathy. And it's, uh, but you do it to the maximum extent possible. And it may not always be possible. So what I'd like to do here is uh, speaking and uh, give you a quote, but speaking in relation to the attacks of 9-11, Analyst uh, Jay Tonnell Yardy with the Security Intelligence Group observed, quote, to demonstrate any degree of empathy, regardless of how slight, implied conceding some validity to the act. To empathize was to sympathize. To sympathize was unimaginable, unforgivable. Well, this stigma, while understandable, must be broken if we're going to prevail in the long term. You know, when... Uh, Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara was asked what was the most important lesson he learned from Vietnam. His response was the need to empathize with the enemy. And as he further lamented in his book entitled In Retrospect, quote, our misjudgment of friend and foe alike reflected our profound ignorance of the history, culture, and politics of the people in the area. Well, in our own centers, project work in which we try to bridge differences between adversaries based on commonly shared religious values, empathy plays quite a role. Uh, a good il illustration of this is the, uh, the uh, initiative that Fred made reference to with respect to our work in Pakistan with the religious schools or the madrasas, where we have essentially worked with the madrasa leaders to expand their curriculums in order to enable the students to uh, deal with contemporary issues, but also to uh, promote greater adherence to human rights and religious tolerance. And also to transform the pedagogy to create critical thinking skills among the students. And over the eight years in which we were doing that before we passed the baton to an indigenous NGO that is now overseeing the effort, uh, we had reached some 2,700 madrasa leaders from 1,600 madrasas at that point in time. Today, it's about 5,000 madrasa leaders, over 2,500 madrasas. Um, and the, the, the success that we enjoyed in that stands in marked contrast to the attempts of others to do something similar, uh, most particularly the government of Pakistan. And a large part of that success had to do with empathy. For example, one of the things we did was we conducted the effort in such a way that the madrasa leaders felt it was their reform effort and not something imposed from the outside, which means they had a lot of ownership in the change process. Secondly, we inspired them with their own heritage as Fred alluded to in his opening remarks, but these, uh, these schools were once without peer as institutions of higher learning in the world at the time. Uh, and then sadly, over a period of time, particularly under British colonial rule where they tried to secularize them, fearful of losing their Muslim identity, uh, most of these schools purged themselves of all disciplines that were either Western or secular in nature to the point where the vast majority today are about rote memorization of the Quran and the study of Islamic principles. But we go even further back in their heritage to the early days of the religion, when many of the pioneering breakthroughs in the arts and sciences uh, took place under Islam, including religious tolerance at a time when Christianity was woefully intolerant. And the more that these madrasa leaders hear this, 
uh, we don't dwell on it, but when they hear it, they walk a little taller and they start thinking maybe we can do better as well. And finally, I think uh, perhaps most importantly, this gets to empathy as well, but grounding all suggested uh, change in Islamic principles so that they can genuinely feel that they are uh, becoming better Muslims in the process. Now, for the last five years that we were involved with this effort, the State Department, or let me say the embassy in Islamabad, uh, was not supportive of our efforts until finally one day they came to their senses in a a uh, contingent from the State Department came over to our offices and said, you know, we want to we want to build our strategy around your work. Because they finally saw that what we were doing there with dealing with the ideas behind the guns was every bit as strategic as anything else that was taking place on or off the battlefield. So uh, with that, we were able to uh, start getting some support, which was very helpful. And that, uh, that continues to this day. Um, I'd say that uh, in this kind of work, there's uh, any number of anecdotes that one could share. I'll just give you two real quick. Uh, one was uh, back, uh, I don't know if you recall, when the Taliban had taken over the Swat Valley in Pakistan. Um, heads were rolling. It was a, a very bad time. And we were conducting a workshop for 16 madrasas surrounding the, the, the Swat Valley. And in the course of the workshop, toward the end, one gentleman stood up, who was a madrasa leader, but he was also a terrorist commander, commander in Lashkari Taiba, which is uh, the friendly folks that brought you those attacks on Mumbai a few years ago, and have done a lot of damage since. Uh, but he got up, got up instead and, and, and stood up and said, you know, I came here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to discredit everything you have to say. He said, but now I stand here before you full of rage, rage because for 26 years I have studied and taught the Quran the way it was taught to me. He says, for the first time in my life, I've sensed the soul of the Holy Quran and its peaceful intent. I now see that the right way to advance Islam is through peace, not through conflict. I'm going to change what I tell my students and I'm going to tell them why. Well, we came back a month later and he had in fact done as he said he was going to do. We had a CNN team with us who had been after us for about three years to document some of our work, so we took him in this time and he said it uh, you know, on CNN for God in the whole world to hear. So I think he recognized that he was getting on thin ice because he said enough, enough after that. But, but I, and I, one of the side responses I had to that was how courageous uh, it is for somebody to stand up and say something like that in mixed company in a context where, where heads are rolling lightly. Maybe he got cut some slack because he was a terrorist commander, but but nevertheless, uh, we have found that when you uh, penetrate that veneer of rage and hostility and engage these folks, uh, not only uh, do they get it, but many of them become champions of, of what it is you're talking about, at great personal risk to themselves. Well, another anecdote was in a workshop uh, we had, uh, there, one of the participants was a Taliban commander of some renown. And he was uh, rather despondent because he'd lost two sons in the fighting. And he told our project director, he said, you know, we just, we don't know what America wants. You command us with guns, we've got no recourse but to respond in kind. So this led to an invitation for me to come to the mountains to tell their senior leadership what America wants, which I did two months later. In the meantime, made the rounds at state defense and the agency to make sure that whatever I said was consistent with U.S. policy. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that it's not only the Afghans in the mountains that don't know what America wants. But uh, anyway, I go into this uh, room. It's probably about uh, a quarter the size of this room. 
Uh, and there's 57 Taliban commanders, several tribal leaders and religious leaders. And most of them were Afghan commanders who'd come across the border. For, you know, we were in the Malakan Agency of Pakistan in the mountains. And um, so it started out, it was clear that some of them were less pleased to be there than others by the looks on their faces. But I started out by saying, you know, that we're not a, a government uh, organization, nor had we received any funding from our government, which was true at that point in time. And I said that uh, while it's uh, uh, clear that the United States may have made some mistakes of late, uh, I think it's important for us to uh, see what we can do if it's possible to come together based on religious values that we share in common and come up with a confidence building measure that can point toward peace. I said, but to do that, you need to know what America wants and this, what the Western perspective is. And I said, simply put, it means laying down your arms, distancing yourself from Al Qaeda and uh, reconciling with the Karzai government. And then that led into a two and a half period of dialogue and lots of exchanges, uh, one of which I thought was particularly important. I'll share with you. I share it with all the military audiences I speak to. Uh, but one young man who was probably in his mid-30s, uh, he was a leader of uh, 350 Taliban fighters in uh, Kunar province, which was just south of uh, uh, where we were over on the Afghan side. And he talked about how one day he'd been out walking with his wife and they were confronted by U.S. military, made to put their hands in the air to be frisked. And he, sa and he uh, made it clear that up to that point in time he was totally against Al-Qaeda and Taliban and all the rest of it. Uh, but uh, as they went about doing this, they used a lot of profanity and uh, he said, I was made to feel humiliated in front of my wife. He said, so I went over. And, uh, you know, I tell people, you know, I, I'm sure something like that couldn't happen anymore. Uh, but I can think of any number of reasons why it might happen. Uh, but it's so foolhardy. It's so shooting yourself in the foot to, uh, you know, gratuitously treat somebody that way in a society where honor is everything. Uh, but anyway, during the course of that two and a half hours, there were a number of questions that surfaced, some of which were very penetrating. First was, what do the American people think? And I thought to myself, well, I breathed a sigh of relief. It meant they were still cutting us a little slack, even though the administration that was causing their problems had been reelected. And I said, well, the American people want peace in the region with democratically stable governments in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they said, why is America attacking Islam? And I said, uh, they're not attacking Islam, and that should be apparent from their past interventions on behalf of Muslims in Bosnia, Kosovo, Somalia, Kuwait. Uh, and they wanted to know why we were attacking Afghanistan. And I said, well, to put that in terms that you hold dear, hospitality, loyalty, and revenge, I said, before we recognized certain members of Al-Qaeda as a threat, we welcomed them into our country. We gave them hospitality. And then without warning on 9-11, they struck. And uh, we wanted revenge. So we asked the Taliban government to turn over Al-Qaeda leadership so we could bring them to justice. They refused, so we attacked. I said, but we did so with a heavy heart because most Americans have great admiration and respect for the Afghan people stemming from our common struggle against the former Soviet Union. And they wanted to know, and I said, and then it's, it's important for you to recognize that some of your tribal leaders are now banding together against Al Qaeda because they have violated your hospitality. Then they wanted to know why we uh, supported Israel. And I really finessed that one by saying we have a strategic relationship that isn't going to change anytime soon. I said, but what is changing is our understanding of compassion for and support of the Palestinian people. I said, over time, that is going to make a difference. 
Well, uh, we broke for prayer and then came back in a smaller group to work on a confidence building measure. But during that uh, larger audience, at one point, a very rough looking individual stood up and pointed his finger at me. He said, uh, I can't talk to you unless you become a Muslim. And uh, I said, uh, well, I don't see a problem. I said, Muslim means submission to God. We all submit to God, therefore we're all Muslims. And everybody laughed and we kind of went on the way. And, and it was only a few months later that I learned that the typical scenario there is you convert or you die. And so I thought to myself, you know, the Lord really does look out for fools and incompetence. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, did, we did come up with a confidence building measure which called for uh, uh, establishing a secure zone in the western third of Nuristan, which was the province right across the, the border, a very rough area. And there wasn't much action going on in the western third. But the idea was to try to respond to the fact that all of these Taliban commanders, by the way, some of, I learned, later learned some of them were Al-Qaeda, and I'm glad I didn't know it at the time, but, but all of these uh, seemed to care, genuinely care about their people. And they were really uh, very frustrated, felt a lot of angst about the fact that the billions of dollars flowing to Afghanistan at that point in time, none of it seemed to have ever reached the villages. And uh, so there was great concern. And, and the idea was in this secure zone, we would try to get private development in that would go directly to the village, villages. Well, that never got off the ground, and I can understand uh, 16 different reasons why it wouldn't. I uh, couldn't get the traction with NATO to establish the secure zone. But one thing uh, came out of it that was pretty interesting was uh, several months later, received a call from the Korean ambassador to the United States to see if there was anything that our center could do to help free the 21 Korean missionaries that were being held hostage by the Taliban. And as a result of the uh, extensive networking, that went into that earlier meeting with the Taliban, we were ultimately able to uh, play a very instrumental role in getting them released. Uh, so you never quite know where the seeds you plant are gonna bear fruit. Well, at this point in time, I'd like to just show you a, a four minute video. It will give you a, more of a hands-on feel for the uh, work in Pakistan. لیکن بدقسمتی تھی اسلام میں اس کی کہی اجازت نہیں ہے Why should a child say yes, why not no to militancy? کہ ہم تو ایک روح پر دیتا تھا ایک روح پر دیکھ رہا تھا اس کے آگے پیچھے اس کا پس پردہ اس کا اس کا بات تولنے کا ہمیں نہ موقع ملتا تھا نہ ہم یہ گوارا کرتے تھے کہ اس کی بات اس کا بات تولے چینج تبدیلی اس وقت سے آئی کہ میں نے پھیلا ورک شاپ ازر صاحب کی قیادت میں اس کی رہنمائی میں اس کی لکچر میں ہم نے وہاں شمولیت کی क्योंकि एक होता है क्रिटिसिज्म तनकीद और या फीडबैक जैसे कहते हैं हम लोग कभी कभी एक दूसरे को फीडबैक देना और दूसरा होता है क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग है ना क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग उस, उस चीज़ों को तोड़ फोड़ कर सोचना अल्लाह मियाँ ने तो तनकीदी सोच बचपन में बच्चे के अंदर डाली होती है वो हमारा एक बहुत अच्छा माशा से करतूत है बड़ों का जो कि हम उसको ख़त्म कर देते हैं पता है कैसे एक एक ज़माना ऐसा आता है कि बच्चे की एक ऐसी उम्र होती है जिसमें वो हर चीज़ में पूछता है ये क्यों नहीं ये क्यों ये लाइट इतनी ब्राइट क्यों होती है ये ग्रास इतनी ग्रीन क्यों होती है डिपेंड ये करता है कि तनकीदी सोच को उभारना वहाँ से शुरू हो जाएगा इसीलिए तो आपको बाप बनाया है 
بلکہ بہت زیادہ لوگ ڈیفینیشن جو علم کی کرتے ہیں وہ یہی کہتے ہیں کہ ابیلٹی ٹو ایسک کوشچنس یہ تو ہم جو سوچتے ہیں کہ یہ کہ امریکہ کے ایجنڈے کے لیے کام کر رہا ہے یہود اس میں کتنا امریکہ کے ایجنٹی کا کردار اس سے ثابت ہو رہا ہے جس پر سوچیں یہ تو دین اسلام کے لیے مسلمانوں کے لیے مسلمانوں پر جو بلیم ہے مسلمانوں پر جو داغ ہے ان کی مٹانے کے لیے اور یہ تو مسلمانوں کی کریڈٹ میں یہ بات جا رہی ہے آپ لوگ یہ کہتا ہے یہ یہ کرتا ہے جتنے آپ لوگوں کے ذہن میں ہیں دہشت گردی کے بارے میں انتہا پسندی کے بارے میں سب اس کے آپ سب مسلمان لوگ ٹھہراتے ہیں تو یہ جب آپ سے یہ سنا نا تو میرے ذہن میں تھوڑا There are so many ways that Haji Ayyub has changed that surprised us uh, as well, uh, especially me. When I saw the visit of the Al-Fatiha, when I saw the visit of the Al-Fatiha, I believe that my eyes were in my eyes. There was no idea of the Al-Fatiha. In America, people didn't know what you were doing in the Al-Fatiha. So I was also in the Al-Fatiha. Luta- اور احساس بھی ہوا کہ کاش جیسے ہمارے ملک میں بھی ہو ایسے ادارے ہمارے مسلمان ہیں وہ بیسٹ مسلمان ہیں اپنی مسلمانی پر قائم ہیں لیکن کوئی اس کو تنگ نہیں کرتا ہے لیکن یہاں کے آلات کچھ اور ہیں کافی ڈفرینس ہے یہاں پر کالج میں جو لوگ پڑھتے ہیں نا تو وہ مدرسے کے لوگوں کو اقارت کی نگاہ سے دیکھتے ہیں اور یہاں پر مدرسے میں جو لوگ پڑھتا ہے نا تو ان کے لیے جو کالج کے جو لوگ ہیں نا ان کی نگاہ میں وہ بھی کچھ نہیں ہے Uh, named after Al-Fateh Academy in Virginia and follow the similar model of that school. What he was basically saying that uh, the white-bearded gentleman at the beginning was talking about the fact that he originally went to one of our workshops, which you saw, uh, the, the last gentleman that was speaking was Azar Hussein, was our project director. He went to the workshop with specific purpose of assassinating our project director. Uh, but when he tuned in and, and started listening, you know, had, had uh, we been giving any sort of an American agenda, then Ozzy would have been killed. As it was, he was just challenging the Muslims to become better Muslims. And he was explaining how that happens. And a lot of it had to do with you know, building critical thinking skills that are naturally there in your children and being able to respond to the innumerable questions that they ask in a helpful way. And so it, it went on and he talked about how they had, they had visited uh, a couple of schools here in the United States and were so uh, bowled over by what they saw. Uh, they, he, he said up here, he said, the American Muslims are the best Muslims in the world. He says they get to think freely and, and, and do as they wish. And so he himself is trying to raise the funds to start a school similar to the one that he saw in Virginia. But an interesting aside was uh, about four years after I first encountered him, he's the one who owned the compound uh, where we met, with, where I met with the uh, Madrasa leaders. And... Um, <coughs> excuse me, the Taliban commanders. And um, after that event was over, he made his living by renting construction equipment. And uh, Al-Qaeda came in and confiscated his construction equipment. They also uh, tortured two of the young men who were involved in providing the security for the event, uh, which I was totally oblivious to at the time. I wasn't aware of any security, but uh, I was really saddened to hear that. But when I ran into him again, it was four years later, and it was, you know, a glad reunion, if you will, and he invited me to come visit him again in six months. I told him I would be delighted to do so. But I then asked Ozzy, I said, how could, he, how could he possibly do that when he paid such a huge price the first time I visited? He said, I don't know. So he went over and asked him, and here's what he said. He said, I would rather die than not provide hospitality to somebody I like. So this is indicative of the culture over there. I don't know if any of you saw the uh, movie Lone Survivor, but there was an episode in there where that one survivor was taken in by a village to be cared for, and the Taliban came in to get him, and they stood up to the Taliban, and a lot of gunfire 
No one knows exactly how it ultimately ended, uh, but the survivor made it out. But this is just, it's kind of humbling when you think about different cultural emphases on different things in the world and what, how we view hospitality in America versus that kind of a belief system. It's really gives you food for thought. Well, uh, besides the anecdotes, and as, as I say, there were very many, uh, we undertook some systemic efforts to make a difference too. One of which was to try to develop some model curriculums for the madrasas that were based on best educational practices to be found in the entire Muslim world. And uh, part of that involved taking the National Madrasa Oversight Board. These are the five religious leaders that sit on top of the five sects that sponsor these schools, these religious schools. Um, took them to Egypt and Turkey to view how Islamic education was handled there. And they went, frankly, with a bit of an attitude. You know, what can these secularists teach us religious pluralists? Uh, both Egypt and Turkey enjoyed a somewhat secular reputation. Well, they came back very humbled because they found that not only did Egyptian and Turkish students, could they handle religious questions every bit as capably as any Pakistani madrasa student, but they could also handle contemporary problems because they'd had the right subjects, the science, the math, the rest of it. And uh, so at, because uh, of this finding, uh, they came back, made an agreement with the government to uh, register their madrasas in exchange for the government supporting them, uh, changing their curriculums and the like. And um, they also uh, put, put, laid down a requirement that henceforth all madrasa faculty would be certified. Up until then, there were no standards. You wanted to open a madrasa, you opened a madrasa. And one of the reasons the madrasas have grown like Topsy is because the public schools are an unmitigated disaster in Pakistan. Part of which, this is a little bit of a digression, but this is one of the uh, deep challenges that we were facing there in doing the work we were doing, is the fact that despite the democratic trappings, uh, Pakistan is fundamentally a feudal country. And those at the top are not only not interested in empowering those at the bottom, they want them to stay on the bottom. I think it's one of the reasons that in, when you look at the world index of you know, percent of GDP devoted to education, Pakistan is always very near the bottom. And, uh, you know, there's almost like there's a purposeful intent to keep people as illiterate as possible so they can't vote to upset the status quo. So all that has to change. And uh, we're very mindful of the fact that no matter how many hearts and minds you win, at the end of the day, people need jobs. Uh, otherwise, by default, so many of them turn to the insurgency because they can put bread on the table. So we're trying to work that side of the problem as well. But the, uh, so that's just one indicator. And, and another thing that came out of that was that the, uh, uh, the head of the Deal Bondi sect, which is far more powerful than the other four sects put together, this is where the Taliban came out of, uh, came up with an idea which we sort of planted and that was to develop a peace, te peace textbook that could be uh, put in all of the madrasas. And, to, and so using madrasa scholars, again, it's that ownership piece, uh, uh, such a textbook was put together. And furthermore, a teacher training institute was established in the headquarters madrasa for each of those five sects that I was making reference to. And they've been teaching Madrasa faculty, how to teach the peace textbook to their students. And quite frankly, uh, it's a very impressive work. I really think that uh, I'd love to see every high school kid in America get exposed to it because it's really thoughtful and it gets to the nuances as well. And it's not just about peacemaking with respect to other countries and other religions, but it's also sectarian. And we're just starting a project in Pakistan right now to counter sectarian violence. Uh, and this is going to be a, a, piece, a piece of that. Anyway, uh, at the end of the uh, uh, 
title that were, was given for this lecture. It says, Defusing Religious Extremism. And there, uh, what I would like to do is just share with you a little bit about what we've been doing on that front in Saudi Arabia. But in 2011, the State Department asked us to take a hard look at the discriminatory content in the uh, uh, textbooks, public school textbooks of Saudi Arabia, and then to assess the global impact of that content. Uh, we did that, uh, but we took a very different approach. Uh, we, um, instead of cursing the darkness, which was the approach that others who had tried more abbreviated looks had, had taken, we decided to take a positive approach. And we give them credit for all the reforms that they had already enacted, and they did have some reforms underway and also the progress they were making with their de-radicalization program, to uh, give them all the credit we could for that, but then being very unsparing in our detail of what yet remained to be done. And I'll tell you, this whole exercise was very enlightening to see the degree to which Wahhabist theology uh, influenced the content of those textbooks, but also the behavior of students. And you could find direct license in there for uh, violent behavior toward others who didn't believe in your particular brand of Islam. Uh, you could see direct license given to desecrating the tombs of the Sufi saints in Timbuktu, and, which is exactly what the extremists did when they moved into Mali until the French finally uh, kicked them out. Uh, but uh, this is the kind of, of uh, content that you could see there. And um, fortunately, consistent with the positive approach, uh, we decided that we wanted to do what we could to uh, try to help facilitate the continuation and completion of these reforms through quiet diplomacy. So we asked the State Department at the end, the original intent was to beat the Saudis over the head with this, but we asked them, please do not make this public. Because if you do, then the critics will seize upon the offensive passages that still remain, hit the Saudis over the head, and the hardliners will then step in and nip all further progress in the bud. And uh, fortunately, state uh, went along with it, and we've uh, had occasion to, to have to defend that because, uh, like when uh, President Obama was going over to Saudi Arabia, some uh, scholars from another think tank became aware of the study put on an enormous public pressure to try to get the study released, and, and uh, we were able to deflect that. And uh, as recently as this past November, we had a uh, team of Saudi education scholars and experts uh, and officials uh, come over to the United States to meet with American counterparts to uh, discuss problems of bias and intolerance in national education systems. What you have to do when you're dealing on this basis to avoid any aura of paternalism is you have to have equals coming together to meet about a problem that they share in common. And uh, we have enough problems in our own very decentralized academic system to qualify to sit at the table. But uh, it, it went exceedingly well. And I might say too that uh, almost coincidental with when I went over to brief the Saudis on the report, and this is a out, uh, about a year after it had made its way over through diplomatic channels, uh, the country came up with a national plan for educational reform that calls for doing all the right things, calls for uh, you know, additional purging of the textbooks, uh, dealing with educational standards, uh, and teaching 21st century skills, if you will, but also integrating relig religious uh, freedom and tolerance into the message, which is quite a leap for the Saudis to do. And I strongly suspect that in addition to whatever impact Western criticism might have had, including our study, I think that they see it probably in their own self-interest as the declining influence of their oil wealth takes place, that they need to equip their youngsters to be able to deal in this globalized marketplace uh, not just for economic reasons, but to provide an alternative to the appeals of extremism. 
because a lot of Saudi youth have been caught up in that in the, in the past. So it's, um, you know, it's going to take a while for this to impact to start manifesting itself. But I think the, uh, the strategic implications are enormous. This is the content that has provided the inspiration for groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS. Uh, and uh, we're taking that away is going to, I think it's going to have a huge impact. But uh, I just want to, I, I guess I would like to conclude right now and take questions, but I would want to just uh, try to end on a note of inspiration for the college students and other youth who are in the room here. Uh, if you have an interest in religion and diplomacy, I would encourage you to pursue it. The stakes are very high. The payoff can be very huge if you just stay the course. So I look forward to working with most of you over the next several days and uh, wish you the very, very best in the future. Thank you for the privilege being here. I had a question about applying what you're talking about into pedagogy in the US. I'm a master's student in second language teaching and my thesis is about using religious themes and content for students to help introduce them to a different culture and in the process learn the language of that culture. And I wanted to know what you, what you thought about that. If you've seen headway in the US, if you see any hope here, I know we're very pluralistic and there's a lot of red tape in education, but I would hope that it could work and I don't know what you think about that. But bringing religious themes you know, to students to bring to their attention. No, I, I, uh, I can only heartily endorse what you're talking about. And I've long felt that uh, every high school student in America should uh, be required to take a course in comparative religions just to understand how the rest of the world works. Because uh, we've, for too long now, we've used our separation of church and state as an excuse for not doing our homework to understand how religion informs the worldviews and political aspirations of others. And we're long overdue uh, with uh, getting into it. Um, in fact, frankly, if this, uh, the reforms that the Saudis are talking about doing, if those get carried out uh, faithfully, uh, they'll be ahead of us. And so there's, a, there's so much to be done here. And we need to un have a sophisticated understanding of other world cultures uh, if we're going to make it in the long term. So I congratulate you on what you're doing. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank you for all the work you've done that you uh, mentioned extensively in your talk. Um, I think it applies to every single round table um, area that we'll be discussing here at this conference. So um, I hope that everyone will continue to, you know, pick your brain and, and learn from the uh, uh, ample experience that you've had. Now, specifically, I'm doing research on creating a model to meet sustainable development goals set by the UN. Uh, in order to find a model for development in at-risk conflict areas, so places that you've been. Uh, specifically, I'm looking at the early Mormon community uh, that came into the Great Basin, uh, faced uh, resource shortages, uh, but one thing that they did have that I felt like really contributed to the flourishing of their community was a strong religious conviction and these religious values that allowed them to overlook a lot of the problems that they faced. Uh, and I'd like you to touch on what values that you've seen in, uh, in all of these different areas that you've been that you feel like fit the criteria for effective development and that we can be able to offer to struggling communities. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, a subject that's going to be dealt with at great length uh, during the course of the three days. But uh, I think there's any number of values that you come across in other cultures that are, that are helpful. Particularly, one of, one of the things uh, that I think is probably most valuable around the world and something that we are, uh, as a country, are getting behind in a, in a big way is freedom of religion. You know, freedom to practice uh, your, your, the, the, whatever faith it is that you subscribe to. You find in more than 70% of the countries of the world today, there are restrictions against freedom to practice religion. And when you look at it from a national security point of view, you find that uh, 
those kinds of restrictions are the kinds of things that give rise to uprisings and, and the like. I will share with you just one small anecdote. In the wake of that uh, meeting with uh, the Taliban commanders, the Minister of Religious Affairs from Afghanistan asked if we would uh, conduct some seminars, uh, conferences actually, in each of the, uh, the key areas of the country, bringing together religious leaders and political leaders to discuss uh, how they could mutually support development assistance. Well, the strategic piece of this was the fact that the religious leaders were the lifeblood of the Taliban and the Taliban was actively sabotaging development assistance. Uh, what I was very surprised about was we only conducted three of these. We wanted to do two more and then have a national one where we would invite uh, uh, top Muslim leaders from other countries to participate. Uh, but we ran out of funds. But during those three meetings, we found that the religious leaders were very energized and uh, very positive in their contributions. It occurred to me that what was going on was that under the Taliban regime, religious leaders were paid a lot of attention to. Under the Karzai regime, they were marginalized. And when you, when you are marginalized, it gets very easy to buy into negative agendas. So giving them a chance to participate and feel some ownership and positive change was huge. So, Thank you. You bet. Hi, my name's Eni, I'm an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, and um, my question for you um, sort of stems from a lot of what you've been discussing. Uh, I think we all, as a community and a global society, have a vested interest in um, maintaining religious freedoms and um, not having religious extremism. So my question is, how do we incorporate all of us um, to be able to help with that? How, how do we get people that are both religious and more secular? Like, What role can we all play in this um, together? Because I know you mentioned empathy was a really important factor, but uh, being religious was also an important factor to having empathy. So I guess my question is, how um, can we include people that aren't necessarily religious in this effort? Well, it's a very good question, and uh, uh, one could you know, you can be secular and still understand uh, how important religion is to mm -hmm. other people, if it's, even if it's not to yourself. Right. And if, it's, if we all become imbued with the understanding that, hey, you know, this is what drives 86% of the world's population, gets their reason from being from, from, from their religion. And once you start understanding that and understanding what an impact this is having in the world today, in this uh, much, you know, once the bipolar confrontation with the Soviet Union was relaxed and all these ethnic conflicts have blossomed and religious hostilities and the like, uh, it's time to wake up, do our homework, and, uh, and try to encourage people to, uh, to step out and to uh, study these areas, uh, write research papers on these areas, uh, form clubs and the like. You don't have to be wed to a particular religion, but uh, somehow we've got to, a lot of catching up to do. And so I think your point is well taken. It's not, this, this problem relating to religion in the world today is not just strictly for religious people to, to address. Thank you. You bet. Uh, my name is Saba Yasmin. I'm from Rutgers University. First off, it's an honor to be here, so thank you very much for speaking. Um, one of the questions, sorry, can you hear me? I don't know if my voice is actually re reaching the mic. Barely. Okay. Okay. <laughs> But um, the question that I had was, in the video, the man talks about how he's inspired by American Muslims and their ability to practice their faith. Uh, but ISIS recruits here, and not just here, but in the West in general, and is very successful. And I don't know when this video was taken, but how do you think that reflects on how we are in the Middle East or how we are in Pakistan when we tell them to increase religious tolerance, but clearly we have a problem here with religious tolerance since ISIS is so successful in recruiting. Mm. Well, you've mixed a lot of uh, questions into one there, and uh, uh, we, we do need a better, do a better job of messaging, but uh, quite frankly, the American Muslim community is one of the greatest strategic assets that we have as a country in terms of uh, dealing with this global contest with militant Islam. And uh, we, we recognized that early on in 2006 
we uh, convened a conference of some 30 uh, U.S. government officials and 30 American Muslim leaders, brought them together to see how we could start working together for the common good. And then uh, a year later held another conference where we held everybody accountable to the recommendations of the first. And uh, the specific goals were what were the legitimate grievances and how could they be addressed? Secondly, how could we capitalize on the uh, extensive paths of influence that American Muslims have with Muslim communities overseas, many of them in areas of strategic consequence to the United States? And thirdly, how could we uh, uh, inform our foreign policy and public diplomacy with a Muslim perspective? You know, back in the Cold War, we used to always put on a Soviet hat and look at the problem through their eyes and try to anticipate what they might think. And none of that had been going on with respect to this particular threat. And uh, one thing we did as a result of all this, the doors at the Departments of Homeland Security, uh, State, Defense, and Justice opened wider to inputs from its American Muslim citizens. But the Muslims also formed a new uh, group called American Muslims for Constructive Engagement, and we co-chaired for several years uh, policy forums on Capitol Hill, where we would bring together uh, key legislative staff and key executive branch staff who were involved in the policy process to meet with uh, American Muslim leaders and outside experts, and we would have uh, conversations over lunch about whatever the topic at hand was, whether it was the Muslim Brotherhood, or it was Bahrain, or whatever it happened to be. And uh, these were, nobody made a presentation. It was uh, the staffers who rolled up their sleeves and said, these are the problems we're wrestling with. And we'd have a very rich conversation. And everybody uh, left much better informed. And the whole goal was to develop a much more nuanced understanding of Islam uh, in our uh, policy making process. And it seemed to work. Thank you. Well, we only have five more questions. You guys, you've got the rest of the week. Can we work it that way? Would that be all right? Ladies and gentlemen, ask, uh, join me again with a round of applause oh, for, no. for Dr. Doug Jones.